Good afternoon, sisters, brothers, and guests. As you heard on the uh, slide, my name is Bill Galvin. I'm the president of International Association of Firefighters Local 42 of the Greater Kansas City area. I'm honored to be able to talk about the two line of duty deaths that we experienced in October of 2015. First, I would like to thank the general president, Shapeburger, and all the AIFF staff and DVPs for the assistance during our losses. Within 48 hours, we had peer counselors on the ground meeting with our members, giving them support for the loss of our two brothers. Also, they had staff sent to help us prepare for a memorial that we were gonna have. Uh, we had excellent staff with Jim Brinkley coming on. He, he didn't miss a detail. All he needed was our personnel and a place to have the venue, and he did a wonderful job honoring our brothers uh, being sent by the general president down there. I really appreciate all the calls and condolences from all the leadership from across the nation. It was humbling to me to have everybody call offering support and condolences. It definitely makes me proud to be part of this IAFF organization, and my membership is also proud of that too. These are our two brothers, as you seen in the slide earlier. Larry Leggio and John Mesh. Yesterday would have been John Mesh's 41st birthday. <clears throat> they were both seasoned firefighters and worked at the busy stations. This event ha happened on 2608 Independence Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri on October 12, 2015. It was a building fire, a collapse, FAO Larry Leggio and John Mesh last alarm. It still hurts me today. <clears throat> the purpose of my presentation is to honor and preserve the memory of our two fallen brothers and the others deeply affected with this tragedy and probably prevent and help prepare your department so this doesn't happen to you. I don't want to see any of these happen to anybody, but they will happen. This fire still is in the judicial system and is awaiting the trial. The logistics of the Kansas City, Missouri Fire Department, we have 1,175 rank and file local 42 members. We have 33 fire stations covering 313, 319 square miles with a population of 470,000. We respond to over 125,000 emergency calls per year. We have four members staffing on our pumpers and trucks, and we have six members staffing on our rescues. We man 33 pumpers, 12 trucks, three rescues, a fully staffed ARF division, and we staff a minimum of 20 ambulances per day. The initial response to this uh, building fire came in as a regular alarm. There was a battalion chief with a district safety officer. The district safety officer was a captain. We had three pumpers, two trucks, one rescue, one ALS medic transport unit, and 30 firefighters on the scene. The response elevated. It was called as a second alarm, which was ordered by one of the incident commanders. I believe there was probably a third alarm plus with all the, the uh, equipment and manpower on the scene. We had five battalion chiefs, each with a district safety officer. We had nine pumpers, seven trucks, three heavy rescues, 11 ALS transport medic units, nine other chiefs, which included several deputy chiefs, a rescue chief, and other uh, chiefs that were in the department, plus our air wagon. There was a total of 124 personnel on the scene. This was the building here on 2608 Independence Avenue. You can see by the arrow, the fire was started in the back of the room of the nail salon. This was a three-store building with commercial space on the first floor and apartments on the second and third floor. The fire started in the nail shop and was believed to be intentionally set by the owner of the nail shop. Uh, we found out that apparently she had had, her, had another business in another part of town that started a fire there also. So that's why they believe it was her that started the fire. The first in companies did, had previously done pre-planning <clears throat> on this building and stated that they hoped they'd never had a fire in this building. It's because the building had been remodeled so many different times, they had taken down walls, added walls, 
So it was a tough building to advance hose line if they ever thought there would be a fire. Well, that day came. During the fire, there were several residents rescued from their second and third floor apartment. This fire burned for more than 20 minutes before the evacuation zone was called and the collapse zone established. I believe the two brothers that perished didn't hear the collapse zone being ordered on the radios. They apparently didn't have them turned up or it didn't come through on the radios. This was the top of the building just to show you. Um, the nail sawn was kind of more toward the middle right. There was also a payday loan uh, store to the big building to the left. And on the right on the other side of the alley was a grocery store. This is kind of a front view. And if you notice in the red, I uh, showed the collapse zone where the, where the actual collapse were, where the fire truck and our members were. This is a video. Hey, spare. Hey, As you can see from the video, we probably could have lost a lot more members there in the front. The building didn't collapse in the front. That was shot by one of our members there on the scene. We were lucky it didn't collapse in the front. Here you can see the aftermath of it. We could, like I said, we could have lost more firefighters in there. If you look to the right, at approximately where the end of the brick is, you can see that where a fire truck was positioned. We had a firefighter pinned up against that fire truck uh, with, with debris. We believe this one broke his leg and we had several others injured from this collapse. <clears throat> Total ramification of this tragedy that we were not prepared for. And that's a big key. Be prepared. Loss of life of our three brothers. Two, of the, two were due to the building collapse as you've seen in the video, John and Larry. We, we lost one to suicide. His name was Danny Rapp. This, and this goes back a little further than just this incident, but this was the, probably the final cause to him to commit suicide. He was on truck two, one of the busiest truck companies in Kansas City. About a year before this, he lost a member that was on that same truck company, company Billy Dady, to a heart attack. Not long after that, they lost a member from two truck on the same shift. He was on his uh, wedding reception. They were having a party down at a downtown hotel. He had an altercation with the cab driver when he was being taken back to his hotel room. The police got involved. The member ran from the police. The police officer caught up with the member. Uh, they got into a wrestling match. The police officer was overcome by our member and the police officer shot him and killed him. That was another incident that got to Danny. And the third one was the loss of Larry. The loss of him made him take his own life in December. <clears throat> Two of the brothers that we had that were injured in this haven't returned to work since. <clears throat> one due to PTSD and the other one to injuries. We still have other members too that have injuries from this. We've got members that were sleeping out on the grave site it was sad. You'd find beer cans were out there, out there drinking all night, just uh, mourning over the loss of the brothers we had. It was a sad thing. Being prepared as union leadership before and after line of duty or any situation that possibly leads to behavior, behavioral health issues. Have a funeral committee. We've got one, but it fell stale. I think all we use it for was go to other line of duty deaths. We didn't have a plan. We had stuff in place that we could. We even had uh, cemeteries that were offering free plots to firefighters if you died in the line of duty or not. Well, we didn't have that funeral committee very busy and they were stale. If it's a multiple line of duty address, get assistance from the international. They have, they're a great resource. They have great people working for them and the general president will send anything that you need. Also, get the peer support training. I encourage you to get it for, for any members in your local that are willing to do the job. Get somebody that's dedicated to do it. 
The peer support training is, is awesome. Everybody that's went through it has said it's excellent training. We were one of the first groups to get it in the Midwest area. Since then, we've had two other classes and we plan on having another one in November. Also, know, to where, know where to send your members. Know clinicians, psychologists, psychiatrists. Know the facilities to send them to. Even if it's the IAFF Center of Excellence, be able to send your members there. Know what the insurance will pay for. And if you have the capability, get your insurance to pay for those services. We have a health care trust that we use. I'm going to convince them to move to try to get into the IFF Center of Excellence. I've toured the facility. I know it's a great program. Policies and procedures and develop and implemented a result of the tragedy. The department didn't have a comprehensive collapse policy. That's sad. You know, the policy was developed and became effective June 1st, 2016. I don't know how many in this room ever drill on collapse zones. As a company officer, I never did. I wish I would have today, and I wish everybody else would have that was on that scene. It's sad that we lost two members because we didn't have a collapse zone. And, and all the other policies we reviewed, we tried to review the radio policy, but it's hard to get to move on the radio uh, to say it probably didn't work. Everybody else heard it but a few members, and those members were hurt. Other than that, I would like to thank the International for all the support that they've given me and the opportunity to speak before you all. And so I thank you very much.